Good afternoon, Church. Today's passage is from Hebrews 13, verse 1 to 16. I would like to invite all the congregations to stand on their feet as an honor to the Word of God. Now let's read together. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undeviled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can men do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word that we just read. We thank you, Lord, for preserving this wonderful truth for us to be able to read and study it together today. And Holy Spirit, that I pray that um, today as we dig into your word together, I pray that you rebuke us where we need to be rebuked. I pray that you encourage us where we need to be encouraged. And I pray that you change us where we need to be changed, Lord. And God, I ask that you do that in the midst of our life right now, wherever we are. We know that you're not limited by time and space. I know my word is limited, but Holy Spirit, you're not limited. So do your supernatural work right now in our heart. And we believe, Lord, when we end this service, Lord, we're not the same as we enter this service because we have encountered the very word of God that created life. So do that. Do the, your heart surgery right now as we study your word together. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, I'm an introvert, okay? And every introvert makes some noise. You know what just happened? Nothing, right? Because introverts do not like to draw attention to themselves. Now, I'm the type of person who likes to stay in my own bubble. So my idea of a good time is actually to go to a cafe or library and read books, Okay. And for some of you, the moment you hear the word read, you're tired already, right? You're exhausted. But for me, I'm the kind of person who gets exhausted when I'm surrounded by many people. And because of my personality, I usually don't initiate relationship with new people. Okay? So in fact, people used to tell me back in the days that I had this aura, right? That said, do not disturb me. And because of that, many people's first impression of me was actually really bad. Many people thought that I was a snob. I don't get it. Because according to me, I'm like the most humblest person on planet Earth, right? Of course, that's a joke. But a lot of time, I use my introvertness as an excuse for me to live in my own bubble. So I reason, because I am an introvert, Lord, because I'm an introvert, God, well, it's not like I, I don't love people, but I'm an introvert, so I need my own space, and I'm not good with new people. But eventually, I realized that using my personality as an excuse for not loving people was actually not right. I was actually loving myself 
more. And I simply use my personality as an excuse. So, and that is something that I continue need to repent again and again and again. Because when I do that, I basically say I care more about my own comfort than I care about loving other people. So I basically say I love me too much to love you. Okay? So I need to repent of that again and again and again and again. Okay? But what I'm not saying, I'm not saying that every introvert needs to be an extrovert. I'm not saying that. So if you're an introvert, don't try to make everyone your friend and hang out with them 24-7. You will die young. But be a loving introvert. Create a space in your bubble where you can invite other people in. Be on the lookout for other people. Invite them in for like, you know, introvert dinner or something. Because we're not designed to live in isolation. Now, for my extrovert friends, don't think you get a pass just because you love being around people. See, one of the characteristics of introvert is even though we tend to be socially awkward, but when we love people, we love them deeply. Introvert tend to be a deep lover. While extrovert, while you guys love to hang out with a lot of people, you tend to be, not everyone, you tend to be a service lover. Okay? You love being around people because it energizes you, it gives you strength. And you love to get to new, know new people and befriend them. But you don't spend time to get to know them deeply for who they are. So, and in order for you to love them deeply, that's uncomfortable, that's hard. Because it requires you to move from the shallow conversation of oh, how are you into how's your heart. Okay? And that's personal. And that is not comfortable. And it's not easy. And for many extrovert, they stay away from that. Okay? And the reason why many extrovert don't do it, don't love people, is actually the same reason for introvert. Why? You love you too much to love other people deeply. You care about your own comfort more than you care about other people. Okay, let me put it this way. The root issue of why loving others is difficult is the same for both introvert and extrovert. We are lover of self. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because our passage for today tells us how the gospel actually shapes our relationship with one another. So when I first read Hebrew 13, you know, I was surprised because it looked like a compilation of random last words, right, that are filled with to-do lists. I mean, it felt anticlimax. Because after 12 chapters of talking about, you know, the deep Christological arguments why Jesus is better, chapter 13 seemed very odd. Did anyone feel the same way as me? But I was wrong. Because remember that the book of Hebrew was actually not a theological paper. It was actually a sermon delivered to actual people who struggle to follow Jesus. And throughout the sermon or the letter, the ought to continue to make the same argument that Jesus is better. And if you remember where we left off on chapter 12 last time, the author of Hebrew tells us that right now we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And because of that, we should offer to God acceptable worship. Here's a question. How do you do that? What does it mean to offer to God acceptable worship? Okay. How does it look like in our everyday life? And Hebrew 13 will actually flesh that out for us. It will show us how to live in the kingdom of God. So it's not an anticlimax. Because the order of Hebrew tells us that the life of faith is a life that desperately needs community. See, we will never make it in life without a community that is drenched wet with the gospel. In other words, get this right. The gospel not only transforms our relationship with God, but it also radically transforms our relationship with others. If we only come to church once a week and are not part of a gospel community, we are not worshiping God. We are attending a Christian club. We cannot live Christian life on our own. The gospel shapes our relationship with one another. And there are three ways that the gospel ship our relationship. First, the gospel ship our relationship with others. Second, the gospel ship our relationship with the church. 
and third, the gospel shape our relationship with Jesus. Okay, let's look at the first one. Relationship with others. Verse 1 to 6. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life from the love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Okay, the first one. The gospel shape our relationship with other people. Now, first one, begin with this sentence. Let brotherly love continue. And this is crucial. Because it means that the moment we put our faith in Jesus, listen, we're no longer stranger to one another. In fact, we're not only friends with one another. Yes, we are. But it's more than that. Because faith in Jesus actually makes us a family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And the bond that we have with one another in Christ is far stronger than the strongest biological bond on the earth. Okay, let me put it this way. One day, Jesus was preaching, right? And someone told him that his mother and his brother uh, were outside waiting to speak to him. And you know what Jesus said? This is what Jesus said, literally, okay? It's recorded in the gospel. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who is my brother? And then he looked at the disciple and said, You guys are my mother and brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother, my sister, and mother. I mean, (laughs) only Jesus can get away with saying this sort of thing, right? Because if my mom is waiting outside to speak to me, and I say to you, who is my mother? You guys who listen to me preach is my mother. Let me tell you, please pray for me because I will be homeless by the end of the day. But what Jesus does, he's not disrespecting earthly family, but he was making a point that those who put their faith in Jesus have a stronger bond with one another than the strongest biological bond. Because our bond with our earthly family might last, what, 50, 70 years? But our bond with one another in Christ lasts for eternity. So it means, listen to this, that when we come to a church, when we gather once a week, a church is not a club we go to. A church is a family. So that means that this church is our home. So when we gather together on Sunday, even though it's online for now, we don't say, I'm going to attend RSI. No, no, no. We say, I am home. And this is, I think, especially crucial amid lockdown. Because if we only think of a church as a place that we attend to listen to a sermon, if that's true, then it doesn't really matter which church we attend, right? Because right now, you can find so many different churches that you can go to online. You can go to this church, you can go to that church, and you can find a lot better preacher who preach a better sermon than I do. Facts. But the Bible tells us that the church is not a club, it's a family. So we don't just gather to listen to a sermon. No but we gather to be involved in one another life. If we come to a church simply just to attend and listen to a sermon, then we miss a point, the point of a church. Get this right. A church is a family of people who have a radical commitment to one another. We might not always be in a good term with one another, but we are unconditionally committed to one another. Think of it this way. Think of your siblings. Now, how many of you oftentimes do not like your sibling? Raise your hand. How many of you never like your sibling? Do not raise your hand. Now, I used to fight with my sibling, my older sisters, consistently. 
Like she will tell me, right? Like our parents actually found me in a pile of trash when I was a baby and adopted me out of pity. And then I would pull her hair. Okay, that's how we fight. We don't always like one another. I mean, we have different value. I mean, we don't always approve one of each other's life. But in spite of all those constant fights throughout the years, in spite of all the horrible things that we say to one another, she is still my sister. I am still her brother. I mean, no matter how weird she is, no matter how different she is from me, she's my family. I do not give up on her. She does not give up on me. We radically commit to one another. And not only that, but in fact, we know each other flaw more than other people. Like she saw me run around the house butt naked when I was five and six. And I know exactly how she looked like without makeup. FYI, I think she's still very pretty without makeup. But that's not the point. The point is we know each other flaws so well, but we still stick with one another. Why? Well, because we are a family. Now, do you see that bond that we have within biological family? And the author of Hebrews says that the bond that we have with one another in Jesus is even stronger than that. The author tells us the bond that we have with our brothers and sisters in Christ is stronger than the strongest bond we have with our early family. We do not give up on each other no matter how difficult it is. We have radical commitment to our family in Christ. Let's continue. Let's look at verse 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. In other words, so the gospel not only transforms our relationship with one another in the church, but the gospel also transforms our relationship with strangers. So we must work hard not only to love the insiders, but also the outsiders. In the culture of the day, hospitality was extremely crucial. Because at those times, traveling was not safe and easy. No. So when people made a long journey from one destination to another, they actually rely a lot on people's hospitality to welcome them and allow them to rest in their house. So their understanding of hospitality was not to host a big party where everyone had fun, but rather hospitality was focused on meeting people's needs. And when they did it, they did not expect anything in return. It was just simply a virtue, a very central virtue in their culture. And the order of Hebrew tells us, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. But what's surprising is what he said next, right? For thereby, some have entertained angels unaware. And you're like, wait, what? Entertaining angels? That's weird, yours. Come on. But if we think that entertaining angels is weird, think again. Because Jesus take it to another level, okay? In Matthew 25, Jesus told this parable, okay? If you grew up in church, you hear this a lot. And it was a parable of final judgment, okay? And in that final judgment, there'll be a group of people whom Jesus commanded for giving drinks when he was thirsty, welcome him when he was a stranger, and clothe him when he was naked. And the group asked, well, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you naked and give you clothes? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you home? We do not remember any of it. And you know what Jesus said? When you did it to the one of the least, you did it to me. The point is, there may be more to the people we meet than what meet the eyes. The strangers in our neighborhood may be angels. But let me tell you why this is important. Okay? The point is not entertaining angels. The point is this. You and I are accustomed to think of our home simply as our safety zone. See, we want our home to be a place of comfort and rest. And that's not wrong. But because of it, here's what happened. We do not want our home to be messy. 
We want our home to be as safe, as clean as possible. And we do not like people to intrude a safe place. So when we do welcome other people into our house, we invite those whom we know, whom we trust, whom we like. Not strangers. Am I right? But if we do that, listen, we have yet to understand the gospel. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, God told the people of Israel why they should welcome strangers. Deuteronomy 10, verse 17 to 19. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Now, sojourner is another term for strangers. So it's what, here's what God says to them. God told them, Israel, you must be hospitable to strangers. You must provide them with food and clothing because you yourself were sojourners in the land of Egypt. But then I fed you, I clothed you, I saved you and I brought you home. I showed hospitality to you and brought you to myself. I save you. And now you shall do the same to strangers. And that is the truth about all of us, isn't it? You and I were once a stranger, but that God took us. God bring us to his house. God close us. God show hospitality to us. And if that's true, then we should do the same to others. Listen, that means if we're Christian, see, our home is not simply our safe place. A Christian home is a tool for the gospel. We are to invite strangers into our home and show hospitality so that strangers may turn to family of Christ, in Christ. Our home is not our own, but it's God's gift for us to introduce others to Him. Now, if you haven't read The Gospel Come With a House Key by Rosaria Butterfield, I highly recommend you to read the book. Okay? It is one of RSI must-read books. Now, in the book, she told a story how she became a Christian. So Rosaria Butterfield was a professor at a university and she was a lesbian feminist fighting for LGBTQ equality. She hated Christian. But one day her neighbor, Ken Smith, invited her and a few others over for dinner with his family. So Ken and Floyd Smith actually had an open door ministry. At their home, their door was wide open. People from in the church and outside the church would always welcome in and outside the house. And at first, Rosaria did not understand why Ken and his family would have her over at their house when she hated them. So for two years, two years, she kept coming almost every single week. For two years, she was loved and welcomed by the people she mocked, despised, rejected, and hated. And in those two years, heated, genuine conversation will happen. But Ken will open his Bible and continue to pray for her. I mean, it was so disarming to the point that she continued to return again and again. And in this context of hospitality, Ken actually brought the church to her. And she tried to resist again and again and again. And there were times she ignores Ken's invitation and email. But Ken would gently pursue her and keep inviting her. Ken was so consistent, even when she tried to slip away. And eventually, here's what happened. The gospel melt her heart and she became a Christian. And this is what she said. It was impossible for me to get to the church without the bridge of somebody home. Did you get that? This is the power of Christian hospitality. And let me tell you, so we do not need to have our own master chef show to be hospitable. I mean, if you can cook, that's great. But if not, let me tell you, Indomie, 
seleraku. It's more than enough. Just give them indomie. Just make them shin ramen, and that's more than enough. Because the goal of hospitality is not actually to show people how awesome we are as a host or how well we can cook. No, no, no. Hospitality, Christian hospitality, is simply Christian on a mission in a daily life. And do not underestimate the power of Christian hospitality. Because when you invite people into your home, home actually allow people to speak freely, to be open about their doubt and struggle. And in the midst of that, you actually have the wonderful opportunity to speak the gospel into their personal struggle. But here's what it requires. It requires us to live intentionally. It requires us to open the door of our home and invite others in. It takes our initiative to do so. Because let me tell you something about strangers. Strangers do not come knock at your door and invite themselves in for dinner. They don't. And if they do, do not let them in. It's the kind of strangers we should avoid. But do not underestimate the power of Christian hospitality. And in verse 3, And then the author reminds his audience to remember also their brothers and sisters who are in prison and mistreated, for they are also part of the body. In other words, if we see our brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering, we weep together with them. We care for them. We are to feel their pain as if we were the one who suffer. Let me put it this way. Anyone ever had their toe hit the bed frame? What happened? Well, we did not say, right, well, to bad toe, I bet that hurt. Be more careful next time. Get well soon. No, right? We say, okay, I better not say what I say because I'm a pastor. Otherwise, it might go viral. But I can tell you for sure that I did not say, well, Jesus love you, toe. I'm praying for you. Get well soon. No. See, we must love our brother sisters who suffer the way we love our own body. But then in verse 4 to 6, it gets very interesting. Because in these verses, the author tells us that the gospel also transforms the way we view sex and money. I mean, if you think about it, sex and money are the two worst depravity in our society. And this is interesting because a lot of time when we view sex and money, we see that as individual, personal issue. And it is. But we often forget that the way we view sex and money also involve, affect people around us. Think about it. If we sleep with someone who's not our spouse, see, we're not simply satisfying our sinful appetite, or no, but we are also putting other people at disadvantage. If we're greedy with our money, we're not simply having more for ourselves, but actually we're not being generous with those who are in need. So the way we view sex and money actually highly affected our relationship with other people. Whenever we have sex with someone who is not our spouse, and whenever we're being stingy with our money, we're actually putting our own selfish individual need over other people. And that is not going to work. Because that is the very attitude that destroys community. But Christians are different. See, Christians, we have a completely different attitude towards sex and money. I love the way Timothy Keller put it. He says this, The pagan society was stingy with its money and promiscuous with its body. A pagan gave nobody their money and practically gave everybody their body. And a Christian came along and gave practically nobody their body and gave, they gave practically everybody their money. Now, can you see the difference? Because our culture will we we always say, your money is for you, but then you go out there and have sex with whoever you want. But then Christians say, hold on a second, no, no, my body is for myself. My body is within for marriage. Sex is only within marriage. But then my money is for me to use for other people. Completely different. See, the gospel radically transformed the way we think of sex and money. Our culture 
tell us that sex and money is for our self-satisfaction alone. The gospel tells us that the way we use sex and money is supposed to be to build up other people. And do you see what God the gospel does? The gospel makes us very others-oriented. See, we do not want to do anything that harms our relationship with other people. And that is why we hold marriage in high honor. And that is why we keep our life free from the love of money. And that is why we are content with what we have. But I want you to notice the reason why we can be content with what we have. It's beautiful. Verse 5 and 6. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So the reason that you and I can be content is not because we have everything that we want. The reason we can be content is because we have God with us. We can be content because God has promised us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. I mean, you can't say it in English, but in Greek, in Greek, this sentence is constructed with five negative. So this is what God literally is saying in here. He's saying this, I will never, 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 never leave you nor forsake you. I mean, can it get more obvious than that? God is underlying a, underlying a point here. The reason that you and I can be content in life is because God has promised us that He will never, 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 never leave us or forsake us. And this is the reason why we do not need money for our security and happiness. Because God Himself will be there for us. And He will provide us with our every need. Jesus is what we need. So if we understand the promise of the gospel, then here's what happened. Well, money is just money. See, now money no longer is something that we pursue, but money is simply a tool for us to love other people. We don't need to worry about tomorrow because we have God in our tomorrow. And if we know that we have God in our tomorrow, what can people do to us? Well, the answer is, well, a lot actually. People can kill us. People can take away our possession. People can harm us. People can gossip about us. People can hurt us. But it's what they cannot do. They cannot separate us from God. We have the promise that God is with us. See, we can lose everything and still be content because we have this wonderful promise. It is faith in who God is and His promises that actually enable us to live sacrificially for other people. And do you see how the gospel radically shaped our relationship with other people now? And that is why it is also important that we have the right Christian food which led me to my second point. Relationship with the church. Verse 7 to verse 9. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teaching, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by food, which have not benefited those devoted to God. So the gospel not only shapes our relationship with other people, but it also shapes our relationship with the church. And this is important. Because to live a life worthy of the gospel, it means we must be planted, listen to me, we must be planted in the right church. Because the gospel now shapes our relationship with the church. See, in verse 7, the author tells us that we got to imitate the faith of our leaders. Now, We're not going to talk much about this because we're going to spend the whole sermon talking about this next week. But it's sufficient to say that we must have leaders in the church who preach the gospel and also lift out the gospel. they got to be worthy of imitation. I'm not saying that leaders need to be perfect. 
no leader is perfect. They don't always get it right. But when we look at our leader's life, do they model a life of faith? Are their life driven by their faith in God and His promises? Are they preaching and teaching the Bible faithfully? Because if their life and their teaching does not reflect the gospel, then we might be in the wrong church. More on that next week. But look at verse 8. This is massive. And I'm sure you heard this verse before. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, this is a very, very popular verse, right? But I want you to pay attention to the context of this verse. Because this verse is not simply saying that Jesus cannot change. And that is true. But the reason why the author mentioned the unchable nature of Jesus is for a very specific purpose. Look at verse 9. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teaching, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by food, which have not benefited those devoted to them. So what happened was, there were many false teachers who actually taught diverse and strange teaching to the Jewish Christian. The word diverse literally means new, and the word strange means unusual. So these people, these false teachers, they actually brought new and unusual teaching in the church. And the Jewish Christian actually attracted to this teaching. Because let's face it, who are not attracted to new and unusual teaching? You're like, oh, never heard this before. This is awesome, right? And we do not pre- know precisely what they were teaching, but they were most likely related to food. So maybe, maybe, some of the false teachers were saying, if you keep Jewish dietary law and say no to pork, then God will bless you more. Or maybe, if you fast on this certain day, if you fast every Saturday, then you are holier than others. Or maybe if you eat organic gluten-free foods, or if you are vegetarian, then God is more pleased with you. So whatever it is, it is the kind of teaching that promotes godliness by a mixture of God's word and human wisdom, a mixture of grace and law. Well, some of us might think, well, yours. That's cool, but I think we're too smart for that. I mean, today we know we can eat pork and still be holy. But are we? Because we might not be tempted with a message of godliness by food, but we are tempted every time to elevate many, many good things about the gospel all the time. Because in some churches, it's all about speaking in tongue, right? You've been in that church before because if you don't speak in tongue, you're somehow less Christian than other. At some churches, it's about material and physical blessing. At other churches, it's about pragmatic, practical, everyday life. Or for other churches, maybe it's about being in the right theological camp. So the pastors, they're committed to preach 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. John Calvin, John Piper, and John MacArthur. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I got that from J.D. Career. But can you see how easy it is for us to elevate good things beside the gospel? And here's what the order tells us. Listen, Jesus does not change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It means that we do not need new and unusual teaching. We do not need a fresh word from God. We already have what we need. Because Jesus does not change, the message does not change, the truth does not change, Christianity does not change, our teachings do not change. We do not need a new truth. We already have the truth. And we already have the gospel. Jesus' work needs no addition, no subtraction. It is perfect. So that means we can confidently embrace the truth written in the Bible because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What our heart needs is not new and unusual teaching. What our heart needs is not a fresh new revelation. What our heart needs is to be strengthened by the gospel 
of grace. Grace is the food that our heart needs. Do you see what the author is trying to say here? And we must take this seriously. This is not simply a matter of preference. This is not a matter of, oh, your church preached the gospel? That's cool, that's awesome, that's great. My church is more about everyday practical life, but at the end of the day, every church is the same. Oh no, my friend, not every church is the same. Because here's what the order is telling us. If your church, if their church does not preach the gospel of grace, you have no business being in that church. Because what our hearts need, what you and I need is the grace of God. We need to eat the gospel. And that is why we must be planted in a church that preaches the gospel of grace. We desperately need to hear that week after week after week for us to thrive in our Christian walk. Both the forgiving grace of God and the sustaining grace of God. And the good news for us is because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changed his mind about us. He is the same God who showed us grace yesterday. He is the same God who gives us grace today. And he is the same God who will give us grace tomorrow. And the goal of the church is this. is not to get a fresh revelation from God. The goal of the church is not to be original, to be different from everybody else. The goal of the church is to preach this very same message, the message of the gospel in a fresh way. Because the message of the church does not change. There's salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And the authority of the church is in Scripture alone. So beware of any teachings that promote external religion or for internal transformation. If a church does not teach and live out the gospel of grace, we have no business being in that church. The gospel shapes our relationship with the church. And look at the last point. The gospel shapes our relationship with Jesus. Verse 10 to verse 12. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Now in order to understand what the order is saying, we have to know what happened in the old covenant. Because usually, when the priests offer sacrifice to God on behalf of the people, they must also eat part of the sacrifice. But there's one day. In the Day of Atonement, the day where the high priest of Israel entered the presence of God to offer sacrifice on behalf of the nation of Israel, the sacrifice will be offered to God, and the remainder of it must be taken outside of the city, outside of the camp, and burned. So the priests cannot eat it. And their sacrifices were burned outside of the camp so that a symbol that the people of God may remain inside the camp, inside God's house. But we're different. In the new covenant, we have access to the altar that the priests in the old covenant did not have. We have food that they were not allowed to eat and the altar is referring to who? Jesus. See, if in the old covenant, People did not have access to a grace. In the new covenant, we have access to the altar of Jesus and eat grace. Jesus is the fulfillment of sacrifice that is being offered in the Day of Atonement. So now, we do not find forgiveness and hope by offering our own sacrifice, but by coming to Jesus. So get this. What we need to strengthen our hearts is to feast on Jesus. The only way for us to be strong is by eating the grace of God made known in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Now think about what happened to Jesus. When Jesus was crucified, he was crucified outside the gate of Jerusalem as our final sacrifice. And to be outside the gate means to be rejected and alienated. To be outside the gate means to be a stranger, not welcome inside. 
To suffer at the side of the gates means that Jesus died as a stranger. But why did Jesus do that? See, Jesus suffered outside the gate so that we can be welcome inside the gate. Because you and I should be exiled because of our sin. We were strangers to God's home. We deserve eternal separation from God. But today, the good news of the gospel is that we hear God say to us that He will never, 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 never leave us or forsake us. How come? How is that possible? See, because at the cross, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, the Son of God, was forsaken by God so that when we put our faith in Jesus, we will never be forsaken by God. Jesus died as a stranger outside the gate so that God could invite us into his home. Jesus took what we deserve so that we may eat grace at God's table. This is the gospel, my friend. Look at verse 13 and 14. And therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he injured. For we, here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. And the word therefore is very important. Because the author is telling us, in order for us to be able to live like Jesus, in order for us to be able to endure that, we got to first eat what the gospel has given us. And the good news is we already have that access. He says that because we have eaten the grace of God, because we have seen what Jesus has done for us, now we can go outside the camp. Now we have the strength to be misunderstood. Now we can bear the mockery of people around us. Now we can love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now we can love strangers. Now we can be rejected by the world. But because of Jesus, we have the guarantee that we will never be rejected by God. And now we do not need the world to be hospitable toward us because we have received God's hospitality. Jesus was thrown outside of the city so that we could become the citizens of the ultimate city that is to come. And to the degree we grasp how hospitable Jesus is toward us, to that degree we can be hospitable toward others. To the degree we know that this is not our ultimate city, to that degree we can live our life for the good of others we can embrace the reproach that Jesus endured because we are looking to the ultimate city that Jesus has purchased for us. This is the gospel. Let me end with this, verse 15 and 16. Through him then, let us continually offer up sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. If we get the gospel, then we must live a life worthy of the gospel. But don't get the order wrong. We do not live a life worthy of the gospel to have God. It is because we already have God that we live a life worthy of the gospel. It is through Jesus Christ that we can offer up sacrifice of praise to God. It is through Jesus Christ, because of Jesus Christ, that we can be hospitable, that we can do good, that we can love others, that we can live a life that is pleasing to God. And the key to living a gospel-shaped life is to eat and be satisfied with the gospel of grace. See, it is the grace of God that enables us to be bold. It is the gospel of grace that motivates us not to play safe. It is the gospel of God, the gospel of grace that drives us to go outside of the gate and share the gospel with all the suffering it entails. The gospel, the grace of God is what strengthens our heart. So church, let us continually feed on the gospel and lift out the gospel. This is the gospel shape life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, are, we realize, Lord, that we are extremely short in many ways to live a gospel-shaped life. But yet at the same time, 
the good news is right now that we are already welcome into your home, that you offer us your hospitality, that we can feast on the grace of God, and that will empower us. And that is what very, the very grace that empowers us to live worthy of the gospel. So help us, Lord. Help us to be loving toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to never give up on them. Help us to love strangers and be hospitable toward them. Help us have a new radical view on the way that we see things of this world. And God, I pray that we continue to feed ourselves in the gospel of grace. And as we continue to enjoy and taste the beauty of grace for ourselves, I pray that we be bold and encouraged, empowered to live out the gospel, to be sacrificially loving toward one another, Lord. To do that in our heart, Holy Spirit, I pray that you continue to point our heart toward you, Jesus, and your perfect sacrifice and find strength in your perfect work. Help us, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.